Is it Sam Gray on the keyboard? <clears throat> he, uh, a lot of folks don't realize it. He's teaching himself the guitar. Uh, he is number one a piano player, and uh, um, he does it very, very well. He's a piano man, but uh, he's so talented. He's teaching himself the pian uh, the guitar. I had a friend in my first college. It was the other way around. He was a guitar player and taught himself the piano. Either way, I'm impressed because I'm, I'm like C's confessed this morning, I'm about as ignorant of music as you can get. My, my uh, music professor in my second college, uh, uh, she laughed at me. <laughs> it was bad. It scarred me for life. I really, it was bad. <clears throat> Go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 11. Let me give you a little background for those who are visiting with us this morning or just showed up for the first time. We've been studying Romans since the beginning of the year. And in Romans, we have a lot of doctrines. Romans is called the handbook of the Christian religion and it, because it's very didactic. It's very much a teaching document. But it also teaches us about ourselves. And it's my first year here. I thought this was a great foundation for us as a, as a congregation, as a church, to know more about the church. Um, <clears throat> chapters 1 through 8 are, it's tough to get through those first five chapters, but by the time you get through chapter 5, uh, you build up to chapter 8, and it's so encouraging. And then Paul changes direction, it seems like, in chapter 9. So chapters 9 through 11, he's very much talking about salvation of the Jews. Keep in mind, in Rome, he had both Jewish Christians and he had Gentile Christians. Um, but he's talking about the salvation of the Jews and what was necessary in order for the Jews to come to Christ. Uh, already at his time, they were seeing a greater influx of Gentile Christians than they were Jewish Christians. And, and this... this um, Belief this Messiah who had come had come predominantly to the Jews, but already there was a shift taking place, and Gentiles were being won left and right. That's very important for today's passage. Now, the section that we're going to read right now uh, did I miss one? Um, um, and that is uh, verses 11 through 16 is God's big picture. It is likely that there was no one else who could do what Paul is doing now. Yes, he was influenced and anointed and inspired by the Holy Spirit, but keep in mind that Paul had, had been a Pharisee of Pharisees. He had studied in one of the two great schools of Pharisee uh, religion, Gamaliel. He had been a student of Gamaliel, who, who was a big name in, in Jesus' time, and uh, you couldn't get much better than that. But to give you an idea of what this meant, Paul would have started memorizing the entire Old Testament at the age of five. They didn't carry around Bibles like we do. They did it by memorization. And so here's a man who had been studying the Old Testament for decades, had memorized it starting at the age of five, and he knew it well. And what he's doing here is he's giving us a big picture of God's plan for salvation, not just for the Gentiles, but for the Jews and how that was going to work out. So let's look at that, starting at verse 11. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means, rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. So who's he talking about? He, uh, very beginning, uh, the they is the Jewish people. And he asks a pertinent question. I think it comes out well in the ESV. This is a difficult passage or verse to translate. And the ESV, among others, probably does the best job of asking that question. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? He's saying, hey, were they set up to fail? I mean, was this God's plan that they would fail? That's no, he says. He answers his own question. No. Rather, through their trespass, through their failure to accept the gospel, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So he's given us a picture of how things work. 
so as to make Israel jealous. Hold on to that. That might be a verse you want to underline. As you'll find out when we get to the end. Uh, by the way, I did give you some notes. They're in your program, so hold them up and fill them out as you go along. Verse 12. Now if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? So he's saying, hey, um, things are only going to get better if the Jews turn towards God. Now I am speaking to you Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. So what's he doing? He is uh, he's laying out this big picture. He's just saying, hey, I want, you to, I want you to see this in terms of God's viewpoint from eternity. Yeah, you can get you can get caught up in the fact that it seems to be that the Gentiles are coming to Christ and the Jews aren't. Irony upon irony, but I want you to see the big picture. This is within God's plan. So, yes, the Jews rejected Christ. But that opened up the door for the Gentiles to become Christians. For those to follow the promise that had been given to Abraham, those who followed. So it's, it's available to the Gentiles, but God's so smart. God is so bright, he's brighter than any of you. He uses these big movements of history to open doors that we don't even think about. And you know what? He's going to use the Gentiles coming to Christ to make the Jewish people jealous. Now, think about that one. God's using a base human emotion. Jealousy? How many of you think jealousy is a good thing? Um, actually, it is a good thing. Here's our problem. It's lost, it's lost its meaning in the English language. The etymology, which is a big word, it just means where did this word come from? Okay? The etymology for jealous, does it sound like another English word that's very close to it? Zealous. Just change that first letter to Z. That's where jealous comes from. And it's this idea that the Gentiles coming to Christ, that conversion, what they have, what's going on with them, is going to be such a thing to behold that Jews will become zealous for Christ. So he's going to use them. And then, as we find out later in, in the work, in chapter 11, he's going to use all of that to bring as many people, the full number, to Christ as he can. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? So that's the big picture. Now, uh, this next section, verses 17 through 24, is a metaphor of judgment and hope. And I believe that's um, some blanks in your uh, notes. Fill those in. A metaphor of judgment and hope. What's that metaphor? Well, we get a hint right here in verse 17. But if some of the branches were broken over, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. Well, here's the title of the sermon. You get it from this verse. It also is really what the metaphor is. So next screen is uh, the olive tree. It's stuck. It locked up. Okay. So uh, the title of the sermon is the olive tree. And, um, and, and Paul is using this as a metaphor, as a, you know, a picture, a word picture for us to understand what God is doing here. Have we, uh, if you can maybe get it and move it to that picture, I want you to see this olive tree. Um, I've got a picture of an olive tree that I'd love for you to see. And it's called the olive tree of Ubes. It's on the Isle of Crete. How many of you have gone to the grocery store and you've paid? If you, how many people love olives? I am an olive lover. 
I should have been Greek. Uh, I, I really should have. But you go and you pay the big bucks for what's the expense of all this? Black, in oil, Kalamata of olives. From that region of the Isle of Crete, the Kalamata area, is a little town called Bubets. And within Bubets, have we got there yet? No. You might want to shut it down and start it back up again. Um, is this olive tree, or Google it, even Google it, uh, olive tree Bubet, and that's B O U V E S. Oh, I spelled it wrong. What's that? I spelled it wrong. V O U? V as in Victor, O U V E S, and it's pronounced Bubet. There she goes. This olive tree, and, and it looks gnarly. It's got these, it's got this big, huge, gnarly trunk. This big, huge, gnarly um, knees of, of roots that go into the ground. It's surrounded, you know, it's in a little enclosure, surrounded by a couple of cemeteries too. Oh, there it is. There we go. Yeah. Um, so here is this olive tree. It still produces olives. And they're some of the most prized olives in the world. Now, you can get them, but you're really going to pay big bucks. And this olive tree, they don't really know how old it is. It's listed as one of the oldest trees in the world. It is between 2,000 and 4,000 years old. Still producing fruit. Uh, and, and hopefully they can get that up. I want you to really see the picture that I had selected. Um, it illustrates oh, what I found it. Paul is talking about yeah. here. What it's illustrating is... Um, oh, good. You see this branch <laughs> in the center, just, just above where I'm standing and pointing? It's a little tiny branch. Everything else is like big and gnarly and nasty looking. That's a grafted in branch. The way this has worked to, to last these all these thousands of years is there is a root that is this tree. That's what it started as. But for millennia, it has been tended by humans. That's the only reason olive trees last these thousands of years is humans taking care for them and tend them and, um, you know, graft in uh, growth from other trees so that they can get those characteristics of those other trees. They graft it in. Anybody know about tree grafting? Have you ever seen that? You know, where you, you take a branch from one tree and you stick it in the branch of another, tape it up, and then as time goes by, it starts to grow and bear fruit. Well, that's how all of trees have worked for thousands of years. And that's how this one works. And Paul is using that imagery to teach us about ourselves as Gentile Christians, but also about Jewish Christians and the Jewish people. So he's going to talk about the root, as he already has, verse 17, the root of the olive tree, which is what God planted. But unfortunately, he had to take some away. So that's some of the Jewish people because they don't bear fruit in Christ, they get pruned off. But he is grafted in others, and that's the Gentile Christianity, because this tree, this collective, both Jewish and Gentile, and maybe you understand why the New Testament says, now there is no Jew nor Gentile, there's no male nor female, there's no slave or free, Rather, we are all one in Christ. Can you imagine what heaven's going to be like if we really live up to that? We're not going to be concerned about somebody's skin color or what nation they came from. We're not going to be concerned about whether they're male or female. We're not going to be concerned about any of those things that we think are so important today. We're just going to be people of God. And, and, uh, even one of the things that people love to pick on today, maybe I still think it's phenomenal. It must be just an inherent problem within us. It says we're going to sing a new song, so apparently some of our baggage that we've got about music goes away too. Because we're going to sing a new song when we get there. I just think we have a whole lot to learn, don't you? 
And I think that's what Paul's trying to teach us here. Those of my trained eye. Maybe I'm going to be the one with the problem now. So here's the olive tree metaphor in the olive tree. So it's the image of pruning and grafting of the branches. And that's what he's going to be talking about in these, these next several verses. So to us, the Gentiles, do not be arrogant towards the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So he's speaking to the Gentile Christians right now. So do not become proud, but what? Fear. Fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, and some disagree with um, the imagery that I've pointed out for you. Some disagree that there is judgment against Jewish people and that some fall away and some are being pruned off. There are people who believe you not only get to uh, heaven through Christ, but you get to heaven merely by being Jewish. That's not what this passage teaches. And specifically, you look at this verse, neither did he spare the natural branches. That's a phrase of judgment. That means some branches were cut off and thrown away and burned up. But he's also saying what? He says, be careful. Because if he didn't spare them, he's not going to spare you. So uh, what do we learn here? Note that then the kindness and the severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. That's one of those big if statements in scripture. You know, again, there are some folks who disagree. But this is a big if statement. You have to continue in your faithfulness. If you don't, there's consequences. And the consequences are severe. That's what this verse is saying. But God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. That is a judgment statement. It means you're cut off from Christ. You're cut off from grace. You're cut off from mercy. Why? Not because you got God upset. You didn't cross all your T's and dot all your I's. No, it's because you weren't faithful. And he's saying the same thing of the Jewish people. Do you get it? So uh, what's the big lesson? Here's one of the ones you fill out. The Gentile Christians... Don't get too big for your riches. Have you heard that one before? I think I learned that one from Mama. Did you learn that from Leroy or Gina? Don't so, Gina. Gina, <laughs> yeah. Color me surprised. So don't get too big for your riches. Now let's look at these last two verses. Verse 23. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, who's the they? That's Jewish people will be grafted in. Wait. Paul, I don't understand. And even they, the Jewish people, if they do not continue in their unbelief, in other words, if they turn to belief, will be grafted in. Do you get the enormity of that passage? There is this new Israel. And this new Israel is a spiritual Israel. What's the common denominator? Belief in Jesus Christ. If you're Jewish and you believe in Christ, guess what? You too will be grafted in. Until you accept Christ, you're outside of the root. Did you get that? That's pretty enormous, isn't it? For God has the power to graft them in Again! How can people not understand this? It's as plain as the nose on your face. You know? It just is. Verse 24. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? So... You know, just think of that uh, olive tree picture that I showed you earlier. Uh, 
he's, all he's saying is, you take a wild olive branch and you graft it in, and there's a little, there's a little adjustment period, but you take a naturally cultivated olive branch and you a Jewish person, and you graft it back into the original root, it's going to do so much better. So he's saying there is a plus for being Jewish. He's telling us as Gentiles not to get too big for our virtues, not to get too proud. And remember, this is all about salvation. This is God redeeming his people. And the big, the big word of the day is, who's included in that? Anybody who wants to join. Who does God love? The whole world. For he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Those are all sort of statements. Only God can make those all sort of statements. Everybody can get in. Do you get that? So, what do we learn here? B, the words of hope for a hardened heart. Remember how we started uh, the last couple of weeks. Uh, what he's talking about is the Jewish people have very hard hearts. They're rejecting Christ. They're persecuting the, the Christian church. They're persecuting Gentile Christians in particular. As a matter of fact, uh, in the book of Acts, we see that sort of hatred take place in Paul's own life. He goes back to Jerusalem. Uh, the, the word is he's taken some Gentile Christians in with him to the temple. He's violated uh, the, the laws of the Jewish people, and he ends up starting to, because of that, a riot has started, the Roman guards come and get him, they haul him off, and he ends up in Rome, and, and the rest is history. He ends up in Rome at least twice, and, uh, and the last time he's there, he gets executed, his head is cut off. Um, pretty interesting, right? That much hardness of heart. So what's that, what's that tell us? I, I just want you to see this picture of a stone heart. <coughs> Some people have it. I think our culture is full of it right now. The, the big word, if you're reading about culture, is that we are in a post-Christian society. In other words, uh, what used to be the norm of the day, that you pretty much taught Christianity, you could talk the Bible, uh, you, you, know, you, could, you could do those sort of things. Those days have passed because it's just not in people's vocabulary. It's not on their horizon today. Just take and watch TV. I, I, I'm watching TV nowadays, and I'm thinking, you know, it wasn't that long ago we wouldn't have gotten away with this on TV. You know, some of the stuff that people were wearing or saying, hey, I still remember watching MASH and seeing the, uh, the first time I heard, uh, we don't have kids in here, first time I heard them say bastard on, on primetime TV. I mean, there was a time you wouldn't hear anything on that. Like, there was a whole list. Remember George Carlin, the comedian? You know, seven words you can't say on TV, and uh, guess where that got to be popular? He did it on the Flip Wilson show, so he said it on TV. You know, um, now you take a look at uh, uh, Carl and Seven Words, and they wouldn't even phase most people. When I was in construction, uh, construction workers, by the way, tend to have pretty rich vocabulary. Not. It's uh, a lot of four-letter words. Uh, but in my day, you never would hear a woman say some certain words. Nowadays, it trips off of everybody's tongue. It's like, it's, you know, there's certain words that have become adverb, verb, noun, <laughs> pronoun, article. And it's the same word, it's just, you know, it's used all the time. We are in a post culture, we're a post Christian society, aren't we? There are hard hearts, but there's good news about that. Let's go on. Would someone want what you have? Remember, Paul said the work in the Gentiles was meant to be something that God would use to make the Jewish people jealous of Christianity. I think this is a big question for us today. How many of you have been to churches and you've done a class on how to be a contagious Christian? or uh, friendship evangelism, or some sort of evangelism as to how we're going to get people to Christ. 
And, you know, and all of those are good. I'm not diminishing any of those. But they're products of our Western culture. We're very scientific. We're very evidence-based. We're very fact-based. And we love facts. That's why uh, you will find for churches who still have Sunday schools, you will see classes that are very much about books of the Bible, and it's about the facts. It's when the book, the book was written, who wrote it, to whom they wrote it to, what's contained in it, what does this word mean, that sort of thing. All facts, which is not bad. But remember, the Pharisees studied those for years, and what Paul is talking about here is people like the Pharisees who had hard hearts. They knew the Bible. They could memorize it. They could quote it better than you can, and yet they were devoid of it in their hearts because their hearts were hard. I say to you that there's a lesson in this passage about what sh should be in our lives as Christians. We know at the very least that what has taken place in our lives ought to be something that's noticed. It ought to be something that makes someone jealous. So you start with that question. What about your life would make somebody jealous? They would want what you have. That's a tough question. See, we tend to think, I've accepted Christ, I'm in heaven. But that's enough. We just need evidence. Here, let me give you Bible verses for why you should become a Christian. Those first 14 centuries of the church's life, they didn't carry around Bibles. They didn't whip them out and share them with their friends. No, they saved people by something else. And you remember Acts chapter 2, verses 42 and following. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So the apostles taught. They listened. They memorized. To the breaking of bread and to prayer. You remember that? But there's something. There's, there's this precious jewel in that passage that I just think there's something for us to learn from, and I think it's evidence of what's going on right here. And everyone was filled with a sense of three, three letters. Awe. Oh. They were filled with a sense of awe. There has to be a Holy Spirit change in our lives that people see. It's not something that's just, I've crossed all the T's, I've dotted all the I's. No, there needs to be a real, effective change from this character who accepted Christ to this person who has become the image of Christ. That's what makes people jealous. So, so this last slide, but what about you? What is it about you? Not me, not the preacher, not the elders, but you. What is it about you? Your character. Your passions. You remember zealous? How do you make other people zealous? You show your own zealousness, right? Your treatment of others would make another jealous. They would want what you have. That's the real effective question today. Has Christ changed you so much that somebody wants what you have? So I'm just going to use that as an intro. August 30th, which is a Wednesday night, we're starting a new Bible study. I'm starting a new Bible study. So Wednesday night, 6.30 here, but it's, it's a small group. It's not a Wednesday night meeting. We're not going to have a band. We're not going to have this big formulated Bible study. No, it's going to be a small group study. And I'm just going to call it jealous right now. We're going to break open God's Word. We're going to study it in this little circle. We're going to get to know each other like a small group setting. And we're going to ask 
God to use His Holy Spirit to change us so that we might become attractive to others, that they might want what we have. Um, do you need that class? Let me ask you. We've got some faithful Christians in this in this building. Do you have children who aren't living the path you live? Do you have children who aren't going to church? Your grandchildren maybe aren't going to church. Maybe some of them have even rejected your values, your values. I would say to you, that's your first need. At the very, very least, remember, um, you're not responsible for your adult child's choices. They're an adult child and they're free will. You are, however, responsible for how you live before them. And I think we can live better lives, don't you? I think we can be better images of Christ, don't you? But in order for that to happen, you don't just study God's Word. You study and surrender. And I think there's a nice little equation that if we study and surrender, we make someone jealous. And that might be just some of the closest people in our lives. How do we know that's true? Read 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7 again. First, first six verses sound like it's only the other one. Well, verse 7, that's towards the men, right? But the first six verses talk about women who are Christians and how they might have an unbelieving husband. And remember how it's, how it's phrased? It says, so that you might, by your good character, draw them to Christ. Here's the thing. Verse 7 packs everything in the first six verses and adds a seventh verse to the men in the same way you men. So it might be some of the closest people to you that you draw the ways. Let's stand and pray. Father, as we go our way, I just pray that we are better at being your servants. That we are better at being your children. Father, if any of us leaves here today, may you hound us if we need to surrender a portion of our lives that we haven't yet. I just pray, Father, you worry us, that you just you run after us, and may your Holy Spirit just hound us to the point that we can do nothing but yield to you. Father, raise up within us a desire to let you do the hard work making us into what you want us to be. So Father, 